Six days after the September 11th terrorist attacks, it was President Bush who went to the Islamic Center of Washington, D.C. and proclaimed that Islam is a religion of peace. At the time, the remark was barely a cause for controversy. Instead, it was greeted by most as a call to civility, a note of sanity, a warning to fanatics who might consider taking revenge on some innocent Muslim women shopping for groceries in a headscarf. But now, nine years later, President Bush is widely accused, in retrospect, of having succumbed to a momentary case of political correctness. Many people now believe that his Islam is peace remark was born either of ignorance or of expediency. It did not even take another successful act of terrorism to set off the season we just lived through, the endless summer of holy war. The instigation was a proposal to build the mosque at Ground Zero, or if you prefer, the mosque at the old Burlington Coat Factory in the Financial District. <laughs> what ensued was nothing less than a referendum on Islam. My work means that I travel around the United States asking total strangers a lot of nosy questions about religion. I've found that this question, is Islam a religion of peace more than any other, is now the one on people's minds. But let's acknowledge that to many, the question before us tonight is either absurd or offensive. To one camp, the question is absurd because the answer is patently obvious. Just look at the headlines, they say. If 9-11 is not convincing enough, what about the suicide bombers in Iraq, Afghanistan, Israel, Spain, Pakistan, and for God's sake, even a tourist retreat like Bali? They say, what about Major Nidal Hassan, a psychiatrist in the US Army, who shot his own colleagues at point blank after he spent years studying and reflecting on his Muslim faith? Was he under the influence of psychosis or of Islam? They ask, why do honor killings seem to be a Muslim phenomenon? How could a religion of peace permit a father to order the death of his own daughter? This camp says not only is Islam not a religion of peace, it is intrinsically a religion of violence. The question is absurd, the case is closed. Yet there are others who consider the Islam and peace question not so much absurdly obvious as utterly offensive. This camp asks, how can you condemn an entire faith a religion followed by nearly two billion people because of the atrocities committed by its fringe extremists. <coughs> they ask, why blame the faith when the terrorists are clearly driven more by political ideology than by theology? They ask, why do we not apply the same judgment reserved for Islam to other religions? Why didn't the ethnic cleansing of Bosnia, Herzegovina prompt widespread rumination on whether Serbian Orthodox Christianity is a religion of peace? When Roman Catholic priests and bishops were complicit in the genocide in Rwanda, the world did not blame Roman Catholicism. But the blame <laughs> fell. <laughs> uh, it, <yes. laughs> God is not great. <laughs> um, but for most. The <laughs> Except for your wide readership. The, the blame <laughs> fell on a few rogue clerics. Well, Why do we make such fine distinctions when it comes to religions, other religions, but not with Islam? This camp asks, isn't the Old Testament laced with calls to violence as explicit as those in the Quran? Why do we explain away the warlike verses in Deuteronomy and Leviticus as a product of their time and culture when we do not excuse the sword verses in the Quran? Whether you think the question before us tonight is absurd or offensive, no matter which camp you're in or neither, or whether you think it's appropriate, I'm hoping that what we accomplish tonight is to cause every one of you at least one disconcerting moment in which the preconception you arrived with is shattered. So our format tonight will allow Mr. Hitchens and Mr. Ramadan each 10-minute opening statements, followed by a brief rebuttal. And we'll have a longer period for discussion, and then open it up for questions. 
I hope you'll have some good ones. Uh, I have no tolerance for any interruptions, though I don't expect that, but if we do, we have ways to handle them. <laughs> and also a reminder to turn off your cell phones so we're not serenaded unnecessarily. Uh, so we uh, agreed very congenially before we began that Mr. Hitchens would begin. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Shalom. Welcome back to the United States. Thank you, Laurie, for your introduction. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. I have to be brief, so I'll be terse. Like a number of people who are students of religion, I've spent a lot of time lately, as you should if you have the opportunity, I recommend it very highly, with Professor Dermot McCulloch's uh, History of Christianity. A uh, marvelous work of scholarship and literature, written by a mainstream believer, uh, extraordinarily broad and deep, in which he ponders one very important question, uh, the only one I've got time for now. What happened to the word Christendom? Remember, there used to be such a term. It used to extend across the world, and the hope is that it would extend even further. And it was unironically used to mean those areas of human civilization, and areas yet to be civilized, of course, where the word of Jesus Christ reigned or would reign. And it's all gone. The word is never used except historically or sarcastically now. And McCulloch doesn't say it ended because of the Crusades, though he could, it didn't. Crusades didn't kill it. Not because of slavery, mandated by Christianity, that didn't kill it either. Uh, nor the mass murder of colonial subjects in the yet to be Christianized world. That wasn't sufficient. See, it didn't really end, he said, till 1914, when all the Christian empires of the world, Austria, Hungary, Germany, France, Britain, France is a slight exception to this, but only a slight one, and Russia, all of them commanded by Christian emperors and calling upon their subjects as Christians, went to war with each other and very nearly destroyed the whole human civilization and certainly reduced it to a point where we can't guess where we might be if it hadn't been for this extraordinary outbreak of barbarism. And out of that came the terrors of fascism and of, and of Stalinism, of which it was the seedbed as well. I mention this <clears throat> partly because I want to maintain that there's no such thing as a religion of peace by definition. And second to point out, <clears throat> and that its best historian has to admit something that if, if I was a Christian would make me <clears throat> humiliated. But because there was another empire involved in that war, the Ottoman Empire, which also came to an end, its other name was the Caliphate, the Muslim Caliphate. It went to war on the side of German and Austrian imperialism and Hungarian imperialism. And it lost not just the war, having proclaimed a worldwide jihad against Christianity, except for German and Austrian and Hungarian Christianity, which were its allies. And it didn't just lose the war, but by 1924 had been dissolved by the Turkish leadership, by Ataturk. It lost the caliphate. And that's the only one that still has supporters. The other Christian and religious empires have all gone. But the caliphate still has fans, not just in the Muslim world, sometimes referred to by Muslims as the Dar al-Islam, the house of Islam, but also in what some Muslims call the Dar al-Hab, the house of war, the part of the world that isn't yet Muslim. There are, there are caliphate clubs in London now and Berlin and elsewhere, quite important ones. And what I want to know is why that is and wh what we should think about it. Believers in this fantasy have, Laurie's spared me the need to say much of this, have committed extraordinary atrocities in Istanbul, in Madrid, in India, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, and of course in our own fair city. Um, and the pretexts for it vary. They can be, the excuse for the mass murder can be that Australia has helped East Timor become independent from Indonesia. It can be that Newsweek has printed a full story about the desecration of a supposedly holy book. You never know what it's going to be next. 
but everyone knows to be careful about it, and everyone understands that the threat of violence that backs it is believable. And that's my opening position. Now you will say, I can hear it already being said, you may be saying it already to yourselves because the defense mechanisms kick in. And in any case, Laurie already said it for you. And I hope Professor Ramadan won't feel the need to say it again, but if he does, fair enough. <laughs> you may say, ah, that's not the real Islam. Those aren't real Muslims. Now, isn't that a fascinating objection? Does, is there anyone in this room, I exempt Professor Ramadan because it's his turn to speak next, is anyone in this room who would care to arbitrate that question? Who is to say? Where is the authority that defines who is a true son of the prophet or true interpreter of his work? Part of the problem to begin with, and it's part of the problem because it is a religion, is that it's perfectly true to say we don't know who the true Muslims are. How right that is, who, do, who does speak for it? The, only the second problem with defining Islam as peaceful. Only the second problem with defining it as peaceful has to do with the fact that it's highly fissile and highly schismatic, that there is a civil war going on within it, the religion of peace, as we speak. At least one civil war between the votaries of this religion of peace is already taking place, and some of it is exported outside that world into ours. Very salient fact. The first reason, though, is this. Islam makes very large claims for itself, very large claims indeed. It claims to be the last and final religion, the last and final revelation. When you see bumper stickers, everyone says you can't reduce major things to a bumper sticker. It's not my idea to have bumper stickers saying Islam is the solution. It's a well-known slogan actually of parties associated with the Muslim Brotherhood. They say Islam is the solution for everything. It takes care of all your life and the one to come. Sexuality, political economy, banking, diet, relations with other religions, everything. It's a total solution. What is creepy about the word total? I hope I don't have to tell an audience like this. It's the first five letters of the word totalitarian. It's absolute. It's absolute. It's all-inclusive. It's, it's unanswerable and oddly for a religion that makes such large claims. Notice another thing about Islam. It doesn't particularly like having these claims questioned or scrutinized. In other words, as there, just as there is with all religions, an inverse relationship between the claims they make and the evidence they can produce for them. You must have noticed that. With Islam, a younger religion, and perhaps therefore more in its first flush, there's an extraordinarily strong willingness to say that any challenge to its absolutist claims is by definition profane. And profanity and blasphemy can be the antecedent to very severe punishment, and often are, for Muslims and for non-Muslims. And this is not a road of peace in my submission. Thus my first point completed. Um, the claim to govern everything from hygiene to sex and the afterlife, which contains detailed prescriptions for the good and bad versions of itself, again strikes me as somewhat totalitarian, and they're both based upon two very, very questionable and not very peaceful concepts. One is the idea of a perfect human being, the Prophet Muhammad, and the other is the idea of a perfect book, the Quran, the recitation. Now, the, the category perfect human primate or mammal and the category flawless book that could possibly not use any kind of change, revision, or editing are categories that do not exist. There are no members of these categories. Therefore, any challenge to this faith is bound to lead to heresy and to schism, and does. And just as all forms of absolutism and totalitarianism, leader worship and revealed truth unalterable text always do because they can break, perhaps, but they cannot bend. And thus the latent potential of violence with, between them, among them, as well as within them, is very great. And at any, danger, at any moment, someone is in danger of being accused of being an apostate or an unbeliever. <coughs> this week, 
the Coptic Pope of Egypt, Pope Shenouda, who represents 10 million Egyptians, was hustled onto Egyptian TV. He's not asked on all that often. I don't think he was even asked on this time. I mean, he was told he'd better come on. Why is the leader of Egyptians, huge Christ, Egypt's huge Christian minority suddenly compelled to make a TV appearance? Because one of his bishops had said in an interview that he thought that some of the verses of the Quran showed signs of having been added later on and to have been later accretion. And Pope Shenouda was asked, forced onto the television to say, it's not that that didn't happen, it's it couldn't have happened. It shouldn't even be discussed. So that it, is, it is, has to be claimed even by non-Muslim subjects of a Muslim state that there is, after all, because no Christian claims this about the Bible anymore, no Jew claims it about the Pentateuch. After all, yes, there is just one book that's completely word and letter perfect from the first time it was not even written down, but recited. Now, demands that you believe the impossible do not lead to peaceful outcomes. <laughs> Nor do they lead to peaceful or tolerant regimes. And I'm not going to ask you which Muslim country you would like to live in. I don't know whether uh, Professor Ramana will tell us which one he would pick if he had to, because I don't have to ask you a question like that, because it's already in your mind. Yes, I can. Um, delu I can, yes, uh, and will. Um, <laughs> shall, shall, in fact. <laughs> Sexual repression doesn't lead to peace. The idea that women are inferior to men is a profound cause of unease, let's say the least of it. Um, all religions make some form of this claim. Islam seems to make it less apologetically than most. Uh, claims that the world will come to an end in an apocalyptic form, which will lead to the victory of one religion or another, are not peaceful either. Uh, it's possible, perhaps, I haven't exhausted all my remarks, that the endless teaching of battle stories to children and, and the stories of lethal feuds from 7th century Arabia don't lead to peace, or the forcing of children to memorize and retell such stories by rote doesn't lead to peace either. Ah, it's arguable that peace isn't attainable at all. Uh, it may be, I'll give it in some forms, that, uh, and sometimes in places that religion isn't even desirable. But it will not come by the fanatical adoption of a man-made text and a man-made supreme leader. Nothing but war and tyranny has ever come from the adoption of formulae like these. The only way to moral and intellectual satisfaction, even temporary, perhaps only temporary, but of any kind at all, it comes to those who are willing to take the great risk of thinking for themselves at all hazards and of trying to share the benefits of that tolerance and that open-mindedness with others. And with that, for now, I, I'll rest my case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, first, thank you for, for this invitation here uh, this evening. And I, I really also want to thank, uh, once again, uh, Oxford University Press for organizing my visit here uh, in the States. And, and I won't forget uh, ACLU and others who helped me to struggle for my rights of, for being here in the States and being able to uh, uh, to speak, to listen, and to contribute to the to the American debate or the Western debate, and I know that among us, Jamil Jeffer is here. So I want you to thank you again for this support. Let me go straight to to some of the the points, and and I'm not going to respond straight away to some of the the claims uh, on all the claims, but. Uh, during my talk, as it is the introductory uh, speech, let me uh, highlight some of the points. When I, I got the question, of course, uh, as a Muslim and as a believer, but as someone who is coming from within the realm of religions, it was quite clear that to put it that way was not the right question to ask. 
is Islam a religion of peace or is Christianity or is Judaism or is Buddhism a religion or a spirituality of peace doesn't mean anything for me. It's not the right question. It's not the accurate question. Not because I think that there is a good Islam and the right Islam and there are people who are acting in the name of Islam who are not representing uh, what Islam is. This is not my point. I never said that, by the way. Uh, but the point for me is really to, to, to try to, to deal with a phenomenon, with religion from within, and to try to understand the dynamics and to understand the trends and to understand uh, the diversity. So just to essentialize one religion by saying it's all about war, it's all about peace. And even, you know, uh, said by George W. Bush doesn't mean anything for me. So this is one, one point which is important, but religions and all the religions and Islam among all the other religions are dealing with human beings. And if you deal with human beings, you deal with violence and you deal with peace. You deal with violence because human beings by definition have to do with violence. They have to deal with aggressivity, whereas wars and to expect from a religion not to tackle the issue is just to dream of something which is not going to happen. All the spirituality, go for Buddhism or go for the Bhagavad Gita, you deal with violence. So this is it. Now, what is the answer coming from religions and from trance when it comes to violence and to peace? This is the right question for me. Do we have something which is coming and helping us to go towards uh, peace? This is for me the right question. So now, once again, when I have people speaking from outside, and it's especially the case these days when it comes to Islam, is we speak about Islam and we speak about you know, something which is a, a religion that is perceived through one window or through one interpretation, and we very often take what is visible through the media. But Islam is as complex as Christianity and Judaism and Buddhism and Hinduism. It's a diversity of interpretations. Yes, you are right. The Quran is for the Muslims the very word of God. But many interpretations and many ways of dealing with the books. The problem is not the book, the problem is the reader. Is the way, no, no, we have only 10 minutes. So. <laughs> This is why when, for example, you take a text, and you can do this with the Bible, with the, the Torah, the, 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 the Gospels, it's always the same. Tell me the way you read, I will know what is in your mind, but not for sure what is in the text. And this is something which is the starting point of a serious discussion in theology. Because I don't like all this intellectuals and philosophers and even journalists, they are very keen on, on understanding the complexity of philosophies and the simplicity of religions. That's not right. And the one to blame sometimes are the religious people themselves because the way they present their religion is something which is all of dream and hopes and not dealing with the reality, which is a complex reality. And this is where I think uh, we have to, to come to a better understanding. So, very often when I deal with such topics, I just have to start with the very beginning. We want to deal with the religion, let us speak about religious issues and religious understanding. Not to avoid the starting to just to come to newspapers and headlines. It's not going to help us to understand religion just to go for what is happening in the world. Let us also understand the fundamentals and then come to some of the translation, the historical experiences. Because as much as you can speak about September the 11th, you can speak about the 16th century under the, empire, uh, the Ottoman Empire, which was a great civilization with a diversity, Christians and Jews and, and even non-believers working and living together. We are always speaking about Andalusia. But we can prove everything with history if we don't get a sense of what are the principles we are talking about. So, for example, coming from a, a, a religious viewpoint, I wouldn't say Islam is the religion of peace. I say Islam is a religion for human beings. It deals with peace and it deals with violence. And it helps the people to go from violence towards peace. It's a way towards peace, but it's not a peaceful reality because we are not peaceful beings. We are all intention 
just to get that inner peace in us, and this is the starting point of the Islamic philosophy of human being, is really to start with your own self. Look at your heart and tell me if you are at peace or you were at peace. Peace is a process through which you have, uh, it's a process that you get at the end of a self-education. Educate yourself to get this inner peace. This is coming from the universal message of all the religions. You get this in Buddhism before even speaking, or not even speaking about one God, but you get it in Judaism, you get it in, in Christianity. Educate yourself to get that peace. So you have to deal with your inner wars and tensions. So this is the way we have to deal with the issue about peace. And the starting point is spirituality. Why? Because at the end of the day, it's really something which is important. And this is the difference that you can find between Islam and the Greek tradition. If you come back to Socrates, Socrates was saying, your body in itself is bad. And this is why you have the soul helping you to, mod to educate your body and to uh, master your body. In Islam, there is nothing like that. Your body is not bad, is not good, and your soul is not bad, is not good. It depends on what you are going to make out of it. It's your responsibility because you are free. Your dignity is in your freedom, and you have to use your freedom to make it bad or to make it good. Take the good decision for your body, that's good. Make the bad decision, that's bad. So it's all a question of educating yourself with your own body. And it's exactly the same when it comes to the, the understanding of uh, the world. So this way towards peace, it's based on education. It's based on uh, a spiritual way of dealing with yourself. And you know what is the meaning of that? The very essence of what I'm trying to translate now is jihad. So this is something which is coming from the classical tradition. And once again, the classical tradition is helping us understand jihad is resist the bad to promote the good. And the bad is in yourself first. And then you will try to get the good. And to get the good is this inner peace. So jihad is not the way towards war, it's the way towards peace. Because you have, as a human being, intrinsically to deal with your inner wars and inner uh, tensions. It's exactly the same in the, in the world that what we have to do, you will find something which is the will of God. What is the will of God? Diversity. He made you tribes and, and nations in order for you to know each other. But you know the risk of diversity? It could be lots of knowledge and potential wars. So you have to edu educate yourself to live with other and with this diversity to know each other. So you can look at Islam saying, you know what Islam claims? It's the last and final religion. It's not enough to end with this sentence. The most important thing is what Islam is saying about the other religions. That you have to remove them from the earth? No. He made you tribes and nations in order for you to know each other. So respect the Christians, respect the Jews, respect the people who were before you. So it's a, it's a call towards respect that you find also in the texts. So yes, you will have Muslims. They will take one dimension and interpret this as, as it is the final religion, we are not going to deal with all the others. But you cannot deny the fact that through history, Muslims, in many situations, in many historical situations, were dealing with this diversity, and we learned from the Middle Ages, and we learned from the Ottoman Empire, that Muslims are able to deal with diversity and take from the, Judy, the Jewish tradition. Maimonides was speaking Arabic better than me. He was a Jew, and he was an intellectual, and he was a theologian, and he was dealing with respectful people. So all these Muslims were wrong Muslims because they, don't, they didn't understand that the final religion should not listen to the first monotheist tradition? That's not true. You can introduce this in such a way. It's too simplistic to represent what a religion is and what a history and a historical experience is. So this is for me something which has to do with uh, uh, the diversity that we have that is rooted in the Islamic tradition as well, in the classical tradition that we find it. So when you deal with diversity, know that you, know you need to promote, and it's out of your personal education, mutual knowledge to get respect. But you also have to deal sometimes with oppressors and people who are going to try to take over, and you have to resist. And this resistance in order to reform the world for the better is the very meaning of jihad. Now, once again, I will never deny the fact that some Muslims, 
some theologians in history and now are using some of the verses in a way which is for me unacceptable. And you know, I, I, I go even further than that. Just after September 11, when I was invited by time, I came here and I was asked about this. I said, you know what? It's not only none, it's not only not good and not Islamic, it's anti-Islamic what they are doing. It's against my religion. It's against the principles. So I'm not saying this is the good religion and this is bad. I acknowledge the fact that they are interpreting the text in a way. But what I'm saying from where I am, from within my tradition, is this is anti-Islamic. This is not the right way to deal with the text. So you cannot reduce this into something which is, oh, the only right Muslims are the Muslims who are acting the way I believe Islam is, meaning bad. I think it's not fair. It's not a discussion that we can have. So let me come to uh, my conclusion here. At the end of the day, if you go through the text and you understand the philosophy of this uh, way towards peace, dealing with your own wars and inner tensions and the tensions within the society, you will find interpretations within Islam that are promoting something which has to do with peace without avoiding violence, because we all have to deal with our violence. This is something which is important, and in history you will find the examples for this and for that. So don't rely on history, with history you prove whatever you want. But at the end of the day, this is exactly the case for all the philosophies. All the people who are promoting human rights, we all have to do something which is out of humility to check our people. Because with the best means, you can promote the bad or the worst attitude. In the name of human rights, we want to kill people. In the name of human rights, we can promote and support the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, where so many innocent people have been killed. And I said it from the very beginning, never forget that the blood of an Afghani or Iraqi innocent man or woman is as valuable as the blood of an American innocent man and woman. No discussion about this. So the best ideology in the name of human rights, in the name of democracy, could be used by people to promote the worst. So let us be humble. Instead of criticizing one religion and one ideology, to know that in our universe of reference, you will find people using our texts, our values, sometimes for the good, and sometimes for the bad, sometimes for peace, and sometimes for war, sometimes for dignity, and sometimes for money, sometimes for protecting freedom, and sometimes for geostrategic interests. It's not right to essentialize by saying, or oh, all the wars on human rights, for human rights, or oh, all these philosophies are right or wrong, or promoting a philosophy or a religion of, of uh, violence. I think that this kind of conclusion are very dangerous because they don't give us the opportunity to find in any single religion, in any single philosophy, people of goodwill. These are the people who can talk to each other, understand each other, and make it possible to live in diversity and in mutual respect. Thank you. Well, I also don't think that the motion, if that's what it is, chosen for this evening, is a particularly good one. But I knew about it as long as Professor Ramadan did, and I did at least agree to speak to it, <laughs> in spite of that reservation. <laughs> and um, I make this not just as a point of self-pity, uh, <laughs> but because, for example, Someone in this great city who's become used to making nice these days, Imam Ralph, who describes himself as both founder and visionary of whatever the downtown establishment is now to be called, wrote an article, I'm pretty sure it was on the eve of Yom Kippur for the New York Times, 
in which he said, when you think about it, this is one of the most hand-washing statements I've yet heard him make in the Make Nice department. When you think about it, our word, Islam, is almost exact translation of your word, Shalom. I didn't say it. I've never heard anyone else say it. It isn't true, among other things. Um, Islam may have some relationship to the word salam, which can have some relationship to the word prostration or religious observance. It may, but we know what Islam means, is intended to mean, and does mean, is, is surrender to God. Uh, acceptance of God's surrender, sometimes translated as submission, but in, in any case, the resignation to the divine will. Again, not in my opinion a prescription for peace, but that isn't my only objection to it. I don't think that abjection or fatalism or the prostration before a divine or let alone before holy men who are interpreting the book is a recipe for good health of any kind, mental or physical, since we're talking about the Greek concept of the, of the body and of the spirit and of virtue. Just to get that out of the way. Now, you're right. I was surprised to find myself saying professor, when you say that the problem is not the book, but the reader. In the case of the Quran, that is certainly true of me. It's true probably of every book I've ever read, that there are difficulties I have with it or capacities I don't have with which to approach it or understand it. But if I am reading the Quran, I certainly say, well, I, I, the, I, I can't tell whether this book is the word of God or not. I can only doubt that there is such a thing. But I can hope that this was a bad day for God. Um, can't I? And I can hope to live in a country where I can say that and get applause. Ah. Yeah, yes, and, and, even, and even mirth. And don't think that it isn't a precious thing, and don't think it's being compromised. I'm coming to that. Um, I don't like the idea of a paradise reward for martyrs. Don't like it. It's not me, somehow. Don't like the account, don't like, don't like the early accounts of village squabbles with the local Jews who've taken a look at the new claimant to be the Messiah and decided about him what they decided about the previous claimant. He's no good. He's not up to snuff. Do you think the Jews are ever going to be forgiven for that, by the way? For rejecting two in a row? I don't think so. And I don't see why they should hope for... I don't see why they should hope for forgiveness either. Um, and still I'm allowed to stand here and say this, and there are many parts of Europe, I couldn't do that anymore, or I'd have to be very careful in who I'd invited for the audience. I couldn't do it uh, easily on the air, couldn't do it easily in print, couldn't do it easily in public, couldn't do it on certain campuses, couldn't do it with certain publishing houses. Now, all of this has been done to us by the wrong Muslims. Well, let's get together then, isolate who these wrong Muslims are, who've imposed a culture of violence backed censorship upon us, and let's get rid of them and have an honest discussion about the text and the reader. And I think the ball is in your court, Professor, on that. Just to stay with my own profession, the thing I know best. Not one major media outlet, print or broadcast, has yet shown you what the Danish cartoons actually look like. Yale University Press, which commissioned a book on them which was to include the cartoons, as how could it not, eventually panicked. Yale University Press panicked and published the book without the cartoons over the objections of its author. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. The President of the United States and the head of the Joint Chiefs a few days ago were so pulverized with fear that they had to address personally in pleading tones a Christian nutbag in Florida who might have been or might not have been about to commit a minor act of blasphemy. Is this the culture that Islam wants us to have in relation to it? One of, if you like, preemptive submission, preemptive cowering, backed by the fear of force. Because that is not multiculturalism. That's, not, that's nothing like the gorgeous mosaic. That's actually the absolute negation of what a multicultural system would be like. And a multicultural system has to look rather askance, I think, on a religion whose preachers and websites openly, openly make threats against people like myself, against the Jewish people, against the Hindus, who, for heaven's sake, aren't even 
monotheists can be killed on almost any pretext <laughs> against and and very and a very and a very important point and I have to make it and against the wrong kind of Muslim now professor <clears throat> don't I'll say this as mildly as I as I can don't um, you may not be aware that you were, and I'm certainly, I don't want to increase the area of unexpected offense taking that's been so hugely broadened by the sensitivities of, of a religion that has the answer to everything. But I'll just say I don't greatly care to be told, as if I didn't know, that an Iraqi life is as precious as an American one. And as someone who's visited Iraq quite a lot, had the occasion to think about it a good deal. I wonder if you could mention anything the United States has done in Iraq that is remotely as criminal, as sadistic, and as violent as the blowing up of the mosque of the Golden Dome in Samarra. <laughs> One of the holiest sites in the Muslim world, callously blown up by Sunni forces in alliance with forces who perhaps I'd agree with them for once on this, were, were fascistic Ba'athists. Probably they got the weapons and the high explosive from them. That makes it worse, surely. Intending to start and successfully, in fact, initiating a civil war in which countless thousands of people have been killed, religious processions have been fired upon, funerals have been fired upon, Qurans without number, of course, being incinerated, much more importantly, children, old people, and civilians. Now, where is, I just wonder, You'll be, you'll have to be, you must be able to quote it to me. Where is the Sunni fatwa against this conduct? Where is it? Where is the authoritative statement of moral outrage in the Sunni world saying this is not acceptable behavior for followers of the Prophet? I missed it. And so apparently did the followers of the Prophet miss it because they keep on doing this all the time. They were doing it before the United States got to Iraq, and they'll be doing it after we've gone. So I'm sorry I won't be talked to in that tone of voice. And I want to know, I repeat my question, who has the authority to issue fatwas? Is it Sheikh Haradawi, who you sometimes very much uh, express the respectful, who on Al Jazeera gives advice on all kinds of things, some of them innocuous, sexual matters and so forth, doctrinal rulings, sometimes upon the legitimacy or otherwise of suicide bombing, if directed at Israelis. Not just Jews, of course, but I know, no, we draw the distinction. On the other hand, Hamas, which does the suicide bombing, doesn't draw the distinction. If I can't issue a fatwa against Hamas, if I'm a Muslim, if there's no one who will and they won't, surely someone could say, we don't think Hamas should have on its website and manifesto the reproduction of the protocols of the elders of Zion, a Christian fascist fabrication that is one of the warrants for the Nazi exterminationist solution. I mean, surely that's a question for the UN Anti-Racism Committee on a spare day. Or, or since that spare day never seems to come, for some Muslim authority to say, no, brothers, don't, don't do that. It doesn't come. It doesn't happen. Look on the website, it's still there. Now, you, you would do better, I think, Professor, if you identified yourself as a member of a very small and critical and endangered minority. <laughs> Someone who really is against all this and will say so and will also decry the fact that the religion itself can't seem to throw it off. But you seem to have that a little bit both ways. Now, very well. Stop you so we can get yes, so then my, my, my closing statement is this. If you want diversity, as much as the professor does, as much as I'm sure many people here do, religious diversity, cultural diversity, um, what you need for it is this. You need a secular state with a godless constitution like this one. To, to speak as you did of the Ottoman Empire as a place where there were not just Muslims but Christians and Jews is either not to know yourself or to expect others to have forgotten or not to know what it meant to be a non-Muslim 
under the caliphate or under any similar theocratic Muslim authority to this day. No, what we need, what, secularism is the only guarantee of religious freedom and yours and that of every other Muslim, we will defend. But you won't be surprised that we have some questions for you in the meanwhile. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you laughed a lot, make love to people. And I have a problem with, we are talking about people who are being killed. Are we talking about people, about wars? That's, that's fine. I have a problem with the way you are putting things here. First, you know, when you said the first remark, say, okay, you know what, total, these are the first letters of totalitarianism because Islam is a comprehensive religion, by the way, exactly like Judaism and Christianity. I never met a rabbi, a Christian, telling me you are with God on Saturday and with the, dev the devil on Monday or in, th what is that? But in Islam, it's as if it's all together. It's a very simplistic way of dealing with Islam. It's a comprehensive religion, but there are rights of God and rights of people, and you have to differentiate, and it's very old. Come back to Alain de Libera, the French philosopher, telling you, you know what, separating authority between what is to God and what is to human being, it's coming from Islam. And this was taught and translated into Christianity in the Middle Ages, exactly the opposite of what we think. You may disagree, but at least acknowledge the fact that there are many interpretations in history that say Islam is this total mean totalitarian. What's that? Auto, these are the first letters of autocratic. <laughs> it's not an argument. It's not serious. And as I said, yes, it's, uh, we are talking about reading. And by the way, it's for all the texts. It's the same for the Marxist. You know quite well about the Marxist tradition. <laughs> and you know what some Marxists did with the text? It means that everything that Marx wrote was bad? No. Once again, it's a serious matter here. When we are talking about interpretations, we, I mean it. I mean that, yes, there are people using the text in a way which is not, and you have historically to acknowledge the fact that you yourself might have read some of the text, not in the good way. So this is the second point about now the cartoons and, and, and some of the, the, the things that you were referring to. Uh, you know, look at the Muslim majority countries and look at the Muslims and the Western Muslims. And if you look at the reaction of the Muslims living in the States or living in Europe, you cannot just say Islam was one that all the Muslims were reacting the same way. By the way, the very month of October when the whole story started. I was in Copenhagen and I said to the Muslims, take a critical distance and don't be involved in this. You don't like it, but let it be because this is freedom. The point is that, that you are not making because you are reducing something which is, oh, the cartoon was all about freedom of expression. You don't speak about the instrumentalization by politicians and, and, and governments in Muslim majority countries and even in the West about the whole story because this is too complex to be put in. So, Many authorities, many scholars, and then you come with the who are the, the, the Muslims who are able to, to speak. If you read some of the, the, the things that I'm doing or uh, writing, you would say that yes, I acknowledge the fact that there is a, a, a crisis of authority in Islam. But please, don't tell me today that you didn't hear the Muslim voices around the world criticizing and saying this is unacceptable to kill the people in the streets in, in New York and the condemnation was widespread by the scholars. If you don't hear, of course, there's you know, not less than 12 councils of Muslim scholars around the world from Amman to Istanbul to uh, uh, Paris, Dublin, were condemning this. It's as if they don't speak. Because at the end, when the people are calling to kill, for killing, they are heard. But when people are condemning what is done in the name of the religion, it's as if they don't speak. It doesn't make the headlines. 
But I'm telling you that some scholars did it and said it, and I was one of them. And you know what is very interesting in the, the whole discussion? That when the people like what I'm saying, say, you know what? What he's saying is good, but he's alone. Minority, it's open, but he's alone. But when the people don't like what I say, say, you know why? He has huge followers. <laughs> so depending on if you like or not what is said, you have followers or not. So I can tell you something, that the mainstream Muslim presence in the West, in many Muslim-majority countries as well, acknowledge the fact that they are critical towards the use of the religion. Now, many Muslims, yes, would support, and I did this, and by the way, I was banned from the, this country mainly for that, are saying, for example, that the Palestinian resistance is legitimate. And I said that, and I repeat this here. But I also said that the means used to kill innocent civilians and innocent Jews in an Israeli, in Israel, I cannot accept that. Have you heard that? I said it. So, and I am not, al I am not alone. I'm not alone. So once again, it's many interpretations. Listen to this and uh, also be respectful of this diversity and uh, the way the Muslims are dealing with this. So, so the fatawa, the legal opinions, are coming from everywhere when you speak about some of the issues because you know it's sensitive, so you put it in a very simplistic way. Women, violence, Hamas, and all this together, it gives the impression, oh yes, yes, this is right. But you don't give the people all the interpretation, everything which is done in every one of these fields coming from the Islamic tradition and scholars of today, trying to improve the status of women, trying to, uh, to condemn violence and to promote justice and peace. You also have to deal with this. At the end, you may have a problem with religion much more than with Islam. And to tell me to tell me at the end of your speech, the only right solution is a secular, godless constitution. In the United States of America, I think it's problematic. Because I don't think it's a godless nation here. There is a reference. Only, so, no, no. Only the constitution. No, only the constitution. No, but I don't think that even your, the politician and even the president of the United States of America is referring to something which is a godless secular system. Or I don't understand all the speeches I, 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 I listen to. But the point is that my way of dealing with the secular or separating authority, I don't have a problem with separating authorities. I don't have a problem with this. And it, even my solution in Israel and with Palestinian, I want one state where the people can live together under the same rule of law. But it's as if we agree on this in France, but not really in Israel, because it wouldn't be Israel. So it's a selective, not consistent approach. I want you to say this everywhere in that way, and then you are saying it, but I would say that the people who are uploading sometimes, they want this for some and not for all. So let me tell you something. I'm critical from within. And I think that I'm far from being the only one. And from within the Islamic tradition, listen to also, for example, the Western Muslims, who the way they were dealing with the uh, September 11th the way they were dealing with the cartoon uh, crisis, the way they were dealing with fitna, many of them were saying, no, don't be involved. In the United States of America, how the Muslims reacted to all this controversy on the mosque here in New York, or in burning the Koran day. Listen, it, were they all violent? Or have you heard some voices of reason and peace in this country? I think if you are honest, you heard these voices of peace, of people referring to their religion and saying, we are Americans and what we want for this country is a peaceful, proactive existence and coexistence. I think that this is also coming from their ethics, their values, and you have to value this as being the future. So to dream of something which is a godless future, I think it's a wrong dream. 
but to be able to deal with all this diversity and to listen to the voices instead of rejecting an entity as something which is bad per se, let us look at the people who from within are trying to do good with what they are and what they believe in. I think that this is uh, uh, the way forward for, for all of us and this is the way I would, uh, I would put it for, for, for the future. And uh, I'm not talking about wrong Muslims. I'm talking about a critical debate among Muslims and I hope that you yourself with the people who are supporting some of the views, you are also critical about the way you sometimes reduce the other to an alien presence, not helping us to get to a, a, bet, to get to a better understanding, a, a critical debate. Sometimes I'm just lost with the way you put things because the debate is closed before it started. Thank you. I'm going to try to get to the core of some of what you raised and then get to some questions. We, uh, that ran long, but I think, it was, I think it was very fruitful. I want to distill something that, that came up here, two, two important things. Um, one is the question of authority in Islam. Um, a, a scholar once told me that he thinks the problem with Islam is that every Tom, Dick, and Harry can give fatwa and that there's no pope, there's no magisterium, and so in some ways what you have is um, leadership by whoever has uh, you know, the biggest audience. Now right now, one of the most revered um, uh, scholars is Yusuf al-Qaradawi, um, and he says, he takes a, an opposite position from Professor Ramadan on the question of uh, suicide attacks in Israel. Um, he has a program with 40 million uh, listeners and he has a website um, and he says that suicide attacks on Israeli citizens, even women and children are acceptable because all of Israel is a militarized society and all citizens are combatants. So the question here is he has, you know, he's got this very large, very large audience and since there is no arbitrating authority, there's no uh, single authority, is not what Islam becomes uh, whoever has the, mo has the biggest audience, has, has the sway in what, what the faith is? I think that, uh, it, mm -hmm. it, no, I think it's, it's, it's true. If we look at what is happening now in the Muslim majority countries as well as in the West, that there is something that we can call an, a, a crisis of authority. In the book Radical Reform, I'm tackling this from many viewpoints and not only from, you know, political discussion is really even in our way to deal with sciences, human sciences, ethics, we have this problem. Uh, you know, when you don't know how to manage diversity, it ends up with division and not knowing who is leading. And this is the way. We don't have a church, so we have diversity in Islam. So we have to know how to manage this, and it's problematic. And I would say that if you look today at what is happening, even though we have this crisis, if you look today at what is happening around the world, you will see that we have many councils. Still, the mainstream is not promoting you know, violence and, and extremist views. The mainstream is promoting you know, what is said, for example, about Western Muslims or Muslims living in Muslim majority countries is about transparency, no corruption, democratization. This is the mainstream that is coming. Now we have voices. And you speak about Yusuf al-Qardawi and you were saying that I was uh, a support, one of uh, supporters of, of him. You know, I have one position in every one and everybody I'm dealing with, in history, in the past, and as is even the present. I read what is said and I try to be selective. So for example, on that point, killing, I said no, I disagree. On identity, and when he once was very harsh with me saying, no, we have one identity, and it's Islamic, I said no, we have multiple identity, I'm Swiss by nationality, Egyptian by memory, Muslim by religion, European by culture, these are my identities, he didn't agree. So I talk to people, but I know that on this, for example, in Israel, I disagree with him, but you cannot reduce 
Yusuf al-Qardawi in the world today to this position because he had many other positions on women, on uh, the, 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 the society, on democracy. He is promoting something which is, he called democracy in the Muslim majority country, that you have to consider by saying, okay, on this we disagree and on that. We need to have a critical debate. You can adjust because one position, we don't like one position, we remove the people from the, 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 the landscape. No, they are part of the landscape and they are heard in the Muslim majority countries. Mm -hmm. So this is my position on that. Um, well, I'm certainly not going to criticize Islam for not having a pope. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, it, it would be your, your vis-a-vis -vis in this discussion was horribly in error in any case in that Christianity never had only one pope and still doesn't. I mean, there were several Catholic claimants to the papacy at different times, just among Roman Catholics. But t today, I mentioned one of them, the pope of the Coptic uh, Christians based in Cairo. Uh, the, the Eastern Orthodox don't call their leader the pope. They call him the patriarch. But the Christian world is full of pope types, uh, <laughs> usually anathematizing one another. The, the Pope is just the word that innocent Americans use for the man who claims to be the leader of the Roman Catholics. So I don't think it's possible, in fact, to have a, a moral authority within religion, because I think the two things are so sharply divorced. But <laughs> this, doesn't, this doesn't lead to just uh, chaos, because, and it certainly doesn't lead to the dictatorship of minorities or, or, or extremists. In, I'll give you two examples quickly. In the case of the moral blackmail of Denmark that was backed up by a physical threat to destroy its economy and, and burn out its embassies across the world. Well-coordinated attack of sabotage against a small European democracy. The organizing group was a thing called the OIC, the Organization of the Islamic Congress. Groups all the Muslim countries in the world. It's an increasingly powerful lobby at the United Nations. Hopes to pass an international resolution forbidding all criticism of religion, all forms of blasphemy and profanity. Every ambassador of those countries in Copenhagen went to Mr. Rasmussen, the Prime Minister of Denmark, and told him, under the threat of violence, he should change his law so as to allow, as to allow him to determine what went into the Danish newspapers. And when he said he couldn't do that, things got a lot worse. Now, that's the ambassador of Egypt and the ambassador of Turkey and the ambassador of, of Alger, important countries, in the case of Egypt, containing an enormous Christian population, coming to you as if they spoke for a religion. Either this claim is true or it is not. It's self-evidently not true, but it is certainly made. Don't let's be in any doubt about it. And don't ha let's have any doubt that it means to extend its influence over the people who are sitting in this hall. Second, very quick, the fatwa against Salman Rushdie in other words, the offer of money to suborn murder for the crime of writing a work of fiction in his own name by the spiritual leader of Shia Islam, that's what the fatwa meant then, means now, was after the murder of many people, associated or not with the publication of the book, repudiated ostensibly by the Iranian government after long pressure and lobbying at the United Nations about 10 years ago, I think that was. But I've been since then, I've had the pleasure of going to Friday prayers at Tehran University, twice, to hear the sermon. And on both occasions, there were banners and slogans saying that the, the imam's holy sentence against Salman Rushdie will never die. It hasn't died with the imam. Khomeini's death warrant will always be carried out. Not, I think, a very good use of the premises of a university. I can't speak for whether it's a good occasion for Friday prayers or not. Well, it brings me to a second point. You see, there's something shady involved here. Some people say that Islam and Islamists give themselves permission to lie to non-believers. Sounds like the sort of vulgar, paranoid thing that an Islamophobe would go around saying, doesn't it? It's very easy to disprove, except that it hasn't been, as that example will just illustrate. And these are not minor threats. These are threats to the very core of what we believe uh, is the essential thing for a society, which is the ability to ask questions, to read the books we choose, to pursue unfettered investigations. And these are flatly negated by the, by the claims of a religion that says it is the answer to everything. Can I, can I respond to this? Because yes. really, I think, I think that uh, 
Is no. the, the Takia question? No, 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 no. The Takia no. question is, uh, is uh, no, the point is, on, on the cartoon issue, the way you are translating things is problematic. Let me just come to some of the facts here very quickly. The first thing is that it happened in, in October that the cartoon were published. Between October till January, nothing happened. And I met the Muslim organizations in Denmark, and I told them, and many were of the opinion, don't react. The ambassadors of uh, Muslim majority countries and Arab countries mainly asked the prime minister to meet with them. He refused. And my position that he made, he made a mistake here because he should have met them, telling them, I have no say in this. It has to do with freedom of media. This is not of my business. He didn't do this. They took it as humiliation. They went back. They bought the ah. tickets. No, no, but look. Easily. No, no, well, let, okay. let, no, 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 let me finish because we will come to the point here. Humiliation. They went back and they bought the ticket of a, a, a group of Muslims, among them Muslim leaders in Denmark, to go to Muslim majority countries to just present what was done. Tell me, Egypt is ruled by Islam? Is it Islam which is used there? Mubarak is a secular president, isn't it? Syria is a Muslim leader or is a secular state. All the main societies where the government used this, because you know what happened, is it's easier to use the people to tell them against the West you can demonstrate, but not against the government, which is an autocratic government. So it's not religion, it's political instrumentalization of popular emotions against the West just to make it a religious issue. You cannot just avoid talking about political instrumentalization of countries where there is no democracy. And these countries are not Islamist countries. They are secular, autocratic countries. That on your, third, a, on your you, third point, no, I can't possibly disagree with you. Of course, there's a great deal of opportunism and demagogy, and I'm certain hypocrisy as well. And in fact, I, have, I, will, I will say that I've heard you and seen you saying that before, and I agree. Um, I, don't, I don't think I would classify a country that hauls the Christian leader of its minority onto the TV to say, no, it's not possible. It could be, have been any... Exactly the same, Christian political instrumentalization. One. No, to give you a trivial it's a example. A instrumentalization. No, I would not. Nor would I describe the Alawite regime, it's an Alawite sectarian regime, not a secular one, mm. that is funded by Tehran and is the funder of the murder gang Hezbollah as secular either. No, don't insult me. Not that it really hurts me that That's much. I don't feel Syria. humiliated or anything. All right, no. we're, going whereas, to, whereas we're going to take some Whereas questions. apparently the leader of a proud country like <laughs> Egypt when a demand to the, he makes to you, interfere in the internal affairs of Denmark no, is no. not met, feels... I'm sorry, I just to end this discussion for me on my side, is the <laughs> only fact that you acknowledge the, that there is a political instrumentalization of religion, and you say, I'm right, that's enough for me. This is exactly okay, what I mean. Good. Can we wind up? No, I, think, I actually think that... And that, you were, earlier I, yeah, you, you were trying was, to tell me what Karl Marx said on the subject. Yeah. <laughs> that's your job. Valuable exchange. I think that was worth worth, uh, <laughs> worth hearing. <laughs> but I, I know that um, there are people in the room and also listening in from the satellite sites who want to have some of their questions asked. And a few of them are along these lines, and and they actually are are aimed at you, Mr. Hitchens, because of your ringing endorsement, really, of uh, a secular society and and uh, atheism. Um, a question from Vail, Colorado. Do Jewish, Christian, or other religions have a greater claim on being religions of peace than Islam? I mean, is, is your beef w really no. with Islam, or is it with all religions? Well, uh, I'm sorry the, the, the comrade from Yale tuned in so late. <laughs> I mean, late enough to miss the first four or five minutes of my 10-minute introduction, if you're devoted to a close exegesis of Professor McCulloch's realization that Christianity had out genocided and out warred and out crusaded itself uh, finally by 1914. Um, if you care to pick up, I think you might be able to, and I'll sign it if you will, uh, pick it up. Uh, my book, God is Not Great, you will find a discussion of the warrants for slavery, murder, uh, genocide, and land theft that occur in the books of Moses. 
um, and that are an ineffaceable uh, offense uh, to any civilized uh, person. Um, and the reason why so many Jews are secular, at least one of the reasons. Um, so again, I, I could go on, but I really feel I don't need to. A, a corollary question, would, maybe it's just a, a, something funny. Would, would atheism be a non-religion of peace? No. Somewhere here. <laughs> no, a, a, there's something probably very slightly intolerant about atheism, at least so I hope. <laughs> I should, I might just say though, because I, I really think Professor Ramadan misunderstood me, when I say the American Constitution is godless, I mean, I was quoting the title of a famous study of it by Professor Israel Kramnik. What I mean by that is to say, the US Constitution only mentions religion and God in its preambles when it means to say the ways in which they must be kept out of the public square. That happens to be a fact about our Constitution and the reason why we still have it. Otherwise, the Republic would have been destroyed long before. And that its First Amendment says that religion can be no business of the government, a statement no Muslim society could begin to make. Thank you. But once again, once again, you can just refer to the Constitution and you will have Muslims just referring to text and avoiding the practical uh, uh, um, consequences and sometimes the policies that are promoted in, in one country. And remember that the previous president, George W. Bush, was talking when going not for the same reasons as you, or not from the same source because you were uh, supporting the war in Iraq, but he was doing it in the name of God. So the Constitution here is not preventing someone from within to speak in the name of God, even if he's supporting exactly the same thing, that in the name of the peace that you are promoting, no you are for the war in Iraq. I, mean, uh, I, I can't imagine you're going to defend President Bush. Here. Well, from that, yeah. <laughs> from, from, from that charge, I can. No one was ever summoned to vote for the war in Iraq in the name, in the name of God. And, the president's own church, as well as every other church, Christian church that I know of, was opposed to the war. For whatever little difference that might make, none to me. Right. <laughs> this, I, I think this one is for <clears throat> Professor Ramadan. Why are there no progressive Muslim majority countries with rights for women and homosexuals, etc.? Um, uh, uh, go ahead. <laughs> No, there are, I think that, once again, if you look at uh, the Muslim-majority countries, we cannot just have something which is a, a monolithic vision of what is happening. What is happening now in uh, uh, Muslim-majority countries is really, before just looking at some dimensions of you know, the rights of uh, women within or the rights of uh, homosexuals, for example, is really to look at the situation in the, the whole society and the way it's progressing. Uh, now we have the great majority of the Arab countries, they are under dictatorships, there is no freedom. Religious or secular society, this is the same for all. So if you look at this and you are expecting from within an evolution in this society, forget about it. Look now at what is happening in Turkey. Turkey is changing, moving towards something which is a more democratic system. And you see within that are rights and discussion and critical discussion that are possible. So I would say that you cannot essentialize history and say the Muslims cannot do this. It's evolving and it's changing and it depends where you can have this kind of discussion. And the first, because there are priorities, the first is really to go towards democratization and transparency in the Muslim majority countries. And if you go to Indonesia, even though we are far from a perfect system, you have much more discussion in Indonesia today about the principles, the critical reading of the text than you have in, in you know, Arab countries. So I would say uh, it's evolving, there is no status quo, and now what is also interesting is look at what the Western Muslims living in democratic system, when they can ex express themselves, when they are enjoying uh, freedom and they are not uh, under the political pressure, what they are producing as the Islamic contemporary thought. It's moving, we are talking about citizenship, we are uh, promoting women's rights, we are promoting the rights of the people uh, to live and to be respected without discrimination. So look at the different historical setting and you can see that it's moving and it's changing and there are new answers for new challenges coming from Muslims. But are you saying Tur uh, Turkey is moving in a progressive direction as it becomes more Islamist? 
Is that what you're saying? That, that's quite interesting, the way you translate what I said. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It says much more about what you think than what I said, no. but... Uh, well, wait, you, my, let me finish. You said let, it was moving no, no, in a she, more progressive let, direction. No, what I said is that even the people who are now leading the country, that they are referring to Islam and they were perceived as Islamists, now we don't know how to call them. Are they Islamists or are they moderate Muslims or are they ex-Islamists? The point is that no one here can deny the fact that not only the government, because we can be and we should be critical towards the government, but the people around and the intellectuals in Turkey and within the, even the, the, the party, you have new thoughts and they are coming with something that we didn't see even in the Muslim majority countries, in the Arab countries. So speaking about the rule of law and democracy and transparency, separating and, and promoting what they are trying to promote and to be in tune today with the European uh, principles, and I would say this is the only thing for me which is important. If, for example, uh, uh, Turkey is abiding by the European rules, they should be able to integrate European Union, and not what we have now, because it's a Muslim majority country. We don't care about what they are trying to do. So, uh, don't reduce Turkey to labels. There are dynamics. There are people who are promoting things that are quite interesting. I went there many times, and I can tell you. The women in Turkey, the Turkish women, for all the trends, not only you know from the secular for the Islamists, everywhere they are promoting a better understanding of Islam, a better uh, uh, acknowledging and uh, uh, resisting discriminations, and trying to work for more autonomy. And I would say this is what I said, and this is what I promote. Well. Actually, I agree with you that, the ossif that there was a very ossified, Ataturkist, bureaucratic, intolerant system that, to some extent, has been opened by the challenge from Mr. Erdogan's party. Um, but the reason why Turkey continues to be looked on askance by so much of Europe is not because it's a Muslim-majority country. It was a Muslim-majority country long before the European Union was formed. And no, one, no one's just discovered that. The faith of most of its people is Muslim. It's because of legal and political reasons. One of them is continued illegal occupation of the Republic of Cyprus, which is already a member of the European Union, and the expulsion of a large proportion of its population, the reduction of them to refugee status. Uh, Erdogan's been worse on that than his predecessors. The, other, the second is the refusal of Turks to admit that they're not the only people living in Anatolia, that there's another nation called the Kurds that lives there, which has language and, and uh, national rights of, which have been negated. On that, actually, the, uh, the Erdogan party has been slightly better than some of the Ataturkists. And the third is the, refu the continuing campaign of uh, falsification and lying about the massacre, the genocide of the Armenian population. A continuing disgrace which Erdogan... Which Erdogan has, in has made, too long. Has spoken of in the most thuggish possible terms. Um, a, qu a question from, from Pittsburgh here. Is, uh, is there an acceptable literature of interpretation of the Quran similar to the Jewish oral Torah? Does that make sense? Yes, of course. You know, if you, 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 you come back to the first, the classical Islamic tradition in, in what we call fiqh, law and jurisprudence, and ethics, and, you know, we have a huge classical tradition. The problem very often is that the Muslims themselves, they neglect and ignore their own tradition, but also the people who are coming to Islam, they are just uh, driven by headlines, and it's, they are simplifying the, real, the, the reality of, you know, you can get a PhD in the States or anywhere in the, in the West without having one notion of what is called Islamic philosophy. While the Islamic philosophers, the philosopher referring to Islam as much as uh, uh, Maimonides and, and, and so many, we only know Averais because he's very close to us. But the fact that we refer only to him is just showing us how much we ignore about the others. Do you know that Descartes, who came with the rationality and doubt, read, himself read, the thesis of Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, who was talking about doubt, and doubt as a sense of getting certitude and, and knowledge. 
neglected, not known. And I think that the Islamic tradition is full of that. We have to reconcile ourselves with our past in order to come with a diversity of new visions for, for the future. Uh, and I think that this is uh, missing for all of us. I would say that this uh, neglectfulness towards history and tradition is a problem within uh, the Muslim uh, um, universe of reference as much as it is for Christianity and Judaism and, and all the other great philosophies and religions. We have a few questions here. I don't think we can avoid this tonight about Sharia. Um, it's become a, a kind of a, a, an assumption among many um, Americans now that what Muslims are really after is the imposition of Sharia in every society in which they live, even Muslim minority countries. And um, it's not a lot understood about Sharia, but what is known is that crimes such as adultery, blasphemy, apostasy, and homosexuality are punishable by the death penalty. Um, and to westernize, this seems like a whole legal system that's a violation of human rights. So what is the intention with Sharia, especially for Muslims living in the West? Is the idea that eventually we get there and we all live under Sharia law? You know, this is a, first, is a legitimate question and it's an important question. Because many Muslims living, not only in the West, by the way, throughout the world, you have Muslims, they deny this. They say, no, no, they don't understand Sharia or they reduce Sharia to, to, to the penal code, and sometimes it happens. But Sharia is not the penal code, and, thinks, and, and still with this, that it's not only the penal code, we really have a problem with the understanding of Sharia by Muslims, and the way it has to be understood in, 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 in our time. And once again, many interpretations here. You have some Muslims, and you cannot deny this. Their perception of Sharia, it starts with the punishment, and then it goes towards social justice, because you punish, you go to, and this is for me, once again, problematic, and I'm critical of this, but I cannot deny the fact that you have a tiny minority of Muslim scholars, they think like that, in Nigeria, in Saudi Arabia, uh, in Egypt, everywhere. You have another understanding of Sharia, which is we start with social justice, and then the punishment is part of the whole process. And my position, I have wrote many times on that, for example, in Western Muslims and the Future of Islam, the understanding of Sharia is the way towards faithfulness, in which way we are faithful to some of our principles. So it's not a closed system. Uh, Muhammad Abdu in the 19th century, when he was studying, he was under the, the British colonization, and he was, we don't want this colonization, we want them out of our country, but the parliamentarian system is the best for us as Muslims. It doesn't contradict our system. And he was of the opinion that the democratic system is not opposed to Islam. So you have trans saying this. My position on this is uh, that Sharia is the way towards faithfulness, it's the way towards justice, it's the way towards mutual respect and, 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 and living together. So this is why, for example, when I read the American Constitution or any European Constitution today, and it is said all the citizens, men and women, black or white, should be treated equally by law, this is my Sharia not going to change this. So the point for me is when the principles are respected and the principles of justice is something which are not two systems that are opposed, they are principles that are common that we can live together. So this is where from an Islamic viewpoint from within the Muslim communities in the West, you will see that uh, the mainstream position coming from all the Muslim organizations in the West is we abide by the law of the country, we are loyal to our country, and we act as active and responsible citizens within the country. And the only thing that we can say today is look at the facts and the figures and not only the perceptions, because I was shocked But what I got as an image. I didn't uh, think that this could happen in the States, what we had with the, the, the community center in New York by people saying Islamization of, of America. I saw this in Europe. I thought it was impossible to have it here. And then it came here, meaning that the people are scared. They are, uh, there is a great deal of mistrust. These people are silently colonizing us. So this is where the Muslims, and this is why your question is important, should come and say, look, 
We are American citizens. We abide by the law. We respect the Constitution. We want to be treated equally, mutual respect and equal rights, no discrimination for any religion or no religion at all. This is the way it should be. And if you look at facts and figures, millions of Western Muslims today are just abiding by the law, and they get the three L's that I'm talking about in the book. Is the first, they abide by the law. The second, they speak the language of the country, English as you speak English, or German, or British, they speak the language, and they are loyal to the country. They want the best for their country. This is what it means to be a Western Muslims, or Western, or, 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 or Muslim Europeans, or Muslim uh, American. And I think that uh, this ha the Muslims should also speak out about what they want, but they also need to be heard when they say things like this. Because I have been repeating this for 25 years. And after one, 25 years, what I get is, huh, smart guy. He has a double talk. He say this, but he means something else. So if someone is telling you always, when you say something, that you have something else in mind, there is no discussion. This is once again the end of the discussion because the, the, the point is that there is no trust. There is no potential uh, uh, discussion and critical discussion. And by doing this, let me tell you something which is also important. It's very counterproductive. Because at the end there is no dialogue. It's not possible to talk. Because if you talk and say, oh, you are, if it's, you talk in a good way, it means that you have bad intentions. And if you, you speak in a bad way, oh, now we know your intentions. So what do you do? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Could we accept that as a closing statement from you and let Mr. Hitchman make it? Oh, goodness. Because <laughs> we've gone over. So that's right? fine. I think that's a fine closing statement. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Do I get the same question? I don't mind. Would, would you like to close with that? Um, on Shaya. <laughs> Uh, it really is. I find no, okay. it's, it's I a like big question. I like uh, surprises. Um, <laughs> well, Sharia just means law. I mean, all people say Sharia law, uh, making a, an elementary mistake. And of course, it, it's not the case that every thief has their hand lopped off in Muslim society or every adulterer gets stoned. And, so, and, I'm, and I'm perfectly sure that's not just because it would diminish the labor force so uh, <laughs> radically. Uh, or, or uh, uh, so to speak, disable it. Um, I think it's more because of something I've claimed to notice elsewhere, which is the religion is man-made. And so there are enormous discrepancies in how these things are promulgated and also how they are enforced. Um, and the, most countries and societies come quite early and easily to the conclusion that their own religions are in, in one form or another uh, not, not really practicable. Um, the same, I mean, after all, in, um, in Saudi Arabia, a woman can't even drive a car, whereas in Iran, she can vote. Not for much, but she can, <laughs> as much as a man can, let's say. Her, her vote can be stolen and degraded as much as, uh, as her husband's or her brother. <laughs> Of, there's, an infinite, there's an infinite variation. I, I don't know, it, it, I can't shake what I, was, what I heard, saw once on the BBC from someone whose career in London I followed. I don't know if you know him, you wouldn't like him, um, a guy called Anjam Chowdhury. He's a well, very well-known noisemaker around, around London complaining about secularism, Judaism, all this kind of thing, and he's, he's been in trouble with the law a few times, and... Um, was interviewed on the BBC, uh, went on about how nothing would change until the green flag of Islam was flying over Downing Street and Buckingham Palace and so forth. And was asked, I thought quite mildly by the BBC interviewer, said, well, if, you, if this is the way you feel about Sharia and about a total Islamic rule, wouldn't you feel happier moving to a country where they already had it? And which is, a, I mean, a polite question, but a rather cheap one, I mean, uh, but still. I, what didn't prepare me for the answer? Chowdhury looked straight at the guy and straight into camera and said, what makes you think this is your country? <laughs> I thought it was a very good question. Now, why do you feel, I, know, I think I know partly why you feel, why do you feel it's necessary to affirm that? And of course a Muslim will, should learn the language, should obey the laws, 
uh, should observe, observe the customs and so on. I mean, what, most immigrants don't feel they, so to speak, absolutely have to say that. The, the answer, I suspect, is that it's embarrassing to notice that in places like as far apart as Sweden and as Spain, there are groups of people who say their countries should be part of the caliphate and that that's why they've come here. And if it wasn't for those people, um, you wouldn't be in this position. So it seems to me that, uh, to be, in order to be consistent, you should, you should fear them and dislike them, find them morally and intellectually repulsive, at least as much as, if not more, than I do. And I don't say that you don't, but I do think that that is, that is the urgent uh, priority. On the lady's question about where would be the best uh, country to live if you were um, a, a Muslim and wanting to be a member of a sexual or gender minority, or I think she said a female or a homosexual. Um, so hard to confuse. Um, <laughs> actually, the easiest, the easiest place for, for you to, to live in that case would probably be, I was thinking about it while Professor Ramadan was talking, would probably be, this will be my closing state, would almost certainly be either Bosnia-Herzegovina or Kosovo. Uh, culturally, culturally Muslim, uh, democratic, uh, open societies in southern and Balkan Europe that were saved from obliteration by the power of the United States, which has never had a word of thanks for what it did in that country. And which remains a secular country with a godless constitution. <laughs> That's a note which on which, the, that, that's a note which, on which the, we can end. Which is the last best hope of humanity. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you both. I hope it's been an enlightening evening.